Welcome to the second in a series we are calling L&D's Pivot to Performance, in which Guy Wallace and myself, David James, speak with esteemed guests about their own pivot from learning focus practice towards a performance orientation that more predictably and reliably, let alone efficiently and successfully, achieves demonstrable results for both employees and organizations. Over a total of seven sessions, each two weeks apart, we've invited guests that we know have made the pivot and have achieved real results from doing so. We'll invite our guests to share their stories, we'll question them on their approaches and encourage them to share relatable experiences to inspire you to either initiate or enhance your own pivot. And we'll also seek opportunities to get you involved too. Would you like to end it anything at this stage, Guy? No, that's great. That's what we're all about, the pivot to performance. Good stuff. So perhaps we should start, Guy, with that, with our introductions, and maybe you'd like to, uh, to kick us off first. Sure. Thanks, David. I'm Guy Wallace. I'm coming to you from the uh, beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains of Western North Carolina here in the United States of America. Uh, my story began in, back in uh, 1979 when I joined a training and development organization, because back then we called it T&D instead of L&D. But uh, I was oriented to a performance-based approach to training or instruction, nowadays learning and learning experiences. Uh, back at the very start, I was one of the lucky ones because I was introduced to the work, the thinking of the late Gary Rumler, the late Tom Gilbert, the late Bob Mager, and the late Joe Harless, and, and many, many others in the professional society that uh, I was a part of way back then. Um, and so David and I had decided that we wanted to partner on this series and bring people, as he said, to you to help them share their stories, their approaches, their lessons learned so that we can help you begin or continue your pivot to performance in the learning and development field. Wonderful, thanks Guy. Um, and David James, as I've mentioned before, um, I'm nearly 20, well, 20 odd years in, uh, in learning and development, uh, 15 of, year, of those uh, in-house. I led L&D as well as Talent and OD for Disney in EMEA. And my first realization that a pivot was required uh, was in uh, the, the, the role as Director of Learning and Talent at, uh, at Disney when I was asked to assist in a digital transformation of an entire country. And I knew then that training courses and e-learning weren't going to help me uh, and that we need to have a different conversation to find different solutions. Um, but, uh, but my actual pivot came a little later when helping clients to develop employees that weren't resisting the learning tech. Imagine that. Uh, and in fact, they embraced it. And this allowed us to aim at truly affecting performance. And the way that they um, that we did this uh, was to find out what they were trying to do and what they weren't able to do quickly or effectively and ensuring appropriate resources were surfaced when needed. Uh, so when we saw 100% take up and demonstrable change, that blew away all the existing myths I had previously and realized that instead of finding new and novel delivery solutions, what if we surface useful stuff at the right time? And that's where it really happened for me. But that's enough about us and time for our guest this week, um, which is Sebastian Tyndall, who is head of L&D at Vitality. Sebastian, welcome. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Uh, so you've heard us uh, and our introductions. Maybe you can uh, you can continue this by giving us a short introduction to you and your background in L&D. How do I follow that? I should have gone first, shouldn't I, really, following <laughs> you two? Um, yeah, but I've, I've specialised in learning development now for over 14 years, either uh, by consulting in, in my earlier roles in my career or, or, or permanent contract. And I've worked with quite a range of organisations now, um, over 70 at my last count, sort of varying in sizes from... SMEs of 50 people to, to internationals to deliver people projects. Um, more recently, I've held strategic roles in the cooperative bank and insurance, uh, Santander Bank, and I'm currently the head of, of learning development at Vitality, where I've been for um, over five years now, which is which is absolutely flown by. <laughs> That's it, and, uh, and not passed without uh, 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 your bump in the road or two, like, uh, like the rest of us in the last year or, or so. A few grey hairs, <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. <laughs> right show, showing off about hair. All right, okay, enough of that. Uh, and what was your personal pivot to performance, Sebastian? What was normal for you before? Uh, what was your aha moment, and what did you lead towards? I think. It, when, when I knew I was getting these questions, it really forces you to reflect, doesn't it? And, 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 and try and pinpoint a moment where you absolutely changed your mindset. But mm -hmm. I would say prior to the pivot, I was, I was very data-led. 
but I was training focused, you know, and it's, it's always been a long held belief of mine that you can go a really long way in any field of expertise by asking the right questions. And I think the question I was used to lead with was what measurables can we find to help us target the training in the right place? Mm. And obviously now in retrospect, you think, well, no, that was completely the wrong question. I think, you know, external thought leadership was really important for me. You know, your, your uh, podcast, David, has been absolutely invaluable you know, to me and I'm very grateful for that. Um, and I think that, that for me helped me sort of wonder, you know, that there is a big world out there and actually what is that world? And, and I do remember the specific meeting that I sat in um, and it was, it was the, the latest in a long line where everybody was more than happy to recommend training solutions to L&D that were going to fix all the problems. Mm. And I just thought, now you, you get quite good, Dennis, explaining, well, training won't fix that problem. And I just thought, I don't want to be in that space anymore. I thought, let's just skip that step altogether and I'll start telling you what actually will fix that problem. Mm. And it kind of led me to that realization that if all you've got in your arsenal is, is, is training, then you'll just scour organization for problems that that will solve. And actually, I don't want to do that. I want to, I want to solve an organization's biggest problem. So it's just almost shifting how you view yourself as someone who works in L&D to actually saying, no, I'm just a competent person that happens to specialize in L&D. I don't have a training bias. I have a performance bias. So whatever is going to move that dial, that's what we'll go for. I think my given area of expertise is not going to influence that outcome. And, and it's kind of really led me to broaden my, my horizons and thought about what the remit of L&D should be in an organization. I don't think we should put self-imposed limits on that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, very wise. Um, but uh, but of course, we know it's all not all about us because it's about the stakeholders. And so, what I'd like to explore with you, because one of the one of the um, the obstacles or the the, um, the 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 areas of resistance that we we hear a lot is, um, okay, I want to change, but I'm not allowed to change, you know, because of these expectations. So perhaps while we're going through this, it'd be good to explore uh, how how you overcome that. But that's that's jumping one step ahead because um, since since you've had your aha moment. Um, you're likely to have refined your approach. Oh, so I'm hearing myself um, uh, echo a little bit there uh, coming through. I uh, hope it's not too distracting. It's gone now, I think. Um, since then, you're likely to have refined your approach to analysis or discovery, uh, depending on uh, what side of the pond you, uh, you're on, um, of uh, diagnosing and addressing performance problems. Could you share with us the highlights, perhaps the top level um, uh, highlights of what works for you and then we can dive uh, a little further in a moment into what that actually looks like. Yeah, sure. So pro probably at a high level, our team have introduced a number of steps um, that are crucially kind of entry and exit points. So we, we've absolutely prioritised speed, mm -hmm. but it's, it's almost counterintuitive because I've always understood there's a fine line between rigour of process and bureaucracy. Mm. So al although we've added those steps, they have actually increased our speed, which was which was kind of a you know a difficult one to reflect on at some point because you're always thinking, do, you know, do we do this? Is this going to slow us down? You know, but the first thing that we that we created was an intuitive form to capture performance challenges, and, and carefully you know kind of design those questions to cut to the root cause of the issue and, and force our stakeholders to gather the right MI and consider exactly what people need to do, not what they need to know. Mm. What do they actually need to do? And then after that process, you know, there's obviously a lot of, a lot of conversation that goes, goes through that and we'll get into that detail later. But, you know, it just starts then with collaboration. It's a collaborative meeting. We get together and we establish exactly what performance looks like and it achieves. Mm. What are the most critical things we've got to get right here um, in order to, to achieve and move that dial? Again, Create quick working groups to say, okay, well, if they're the absolute critical things that we've got to get right, they're the things that we want to absolutely support in people's workflow. So what, what can be created? Get working on those really, really quickly. Um, and again, there's always tight timescales in every organization, you know, but I think for us, a lot of this is happening in parallel. You know, at that point, everyone's working on those resources. It's not just L&D's responsibility, it's everyone in that working group. And if this is a key organizational challenge, We'll all pull together and try and figure figure this out. Um, it may be that we create kind of a digital wrapper to 
to package up some of those solutions or, or something like that to create an experience that allows people to see what resources are available and what is going to be there to support them at the moment of perform. Um, and then it's a lot of small batch iteration, you know, lots mm. of releases to try and achieve, correct, and maintain that performance in the workflow. You know, and, and again, this is this resulted as to, to kind of target my team on on training when it's utilized per project. But you know, unlike many teams, we're not saying increase the figure, we're saying decrease them decrease the number of training minutes you use and for us the absolute perfect rollout for us is one that was so intuitive delivered it didn't need any training mm. you know and that's the sort of thought process for us that's allowed us to reduce the training minutes per project in our organization by 70 percent uh, 77 percent in the last two years and despite that the evaluation metrics improved so suffice to say you know for us that mindset and that shift has really worked in our organizational context. Yeah. So, so um, if I've understood that correctly, because you're able to, uh, to equate and then demonstrate the value of your solutions, that they are actually getting you the intended consequences that, that, that you were brought into, to affect, then you're allowed then to show that it's taking less training time in order to, to deliver that whereas so many in the absence of being able to prove that you are making the the desired difference they're having to demonstrate more hours to justify their existence is that right exactly right and i think it's funny you then end up getting to a point where you you feel like you're really improving on these things and more and more you're saying well actually we don't need any training so a purely resource-led approach Mm. and then you look at how you evaluate projects and go oh my god well we've got to create a new evaluation process for when we don't do any training and then what do we evaluate and it's mm. actually you you find yourself getting to a place where you've pivoted to that point and then realizing that again many of the traditional things that you've done don't work anymore so how do you evaluate a purely resource-based approach and how do you ensure that's translated into performance and it just starts picking away and you start really analyzing on a, on a continual basis about how do we operate and how does this change our role in an organization? Hmm. Well, there, there's plenty in there that, uh, that many wouldn't recognize as L and D, uh, Sebastian. So I think we need to, we need to get down into the, into the details here. So, uh, so what, what we'd like is that you to walk through, uh, some of the details of what works for you, perhaps, um, if you could describe, um, uh, a common or some common ways in which needs are either surfaced or brought to you. And then, um, what you actually do and any compare and contrast you can do from the old way to the new way to help people relate that what are established practices towards what you do, I think could be really helpful. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So it probably, it makes sense to me to go in chronological, uh, chronological order if that's okay mm. from kind yeah. of inception to, to results. I think it just h- helps me understand and, and, and make sure I'm not missing anything out, but um the whole thing's being engineered to allow us to quickly partner, push something along, and even detach if project teams aren't in a place to deliver change. Mm. You know, that way you kind of find that your team aren't stuck in that project purgatory waiting for decisions to be made. And it kind of just maximizes productivity. It's, it's a bit like, and the way we explain it internally, it's just like Lego blocks. You know, each block, the block is completed, picked up, anyone in the team can push it along and finish it. We even have live percentage updates on the progress of each block, who is working on what and when it's due to be completed. So you can just literally see at any one time where where things are. And it just allows us to seamlessly attach, detach and rejoin projects rather than waiting for critical decisions to be made, which, you know, in some organisations that we've worked, I've worked in certainly can take months, you Mm -hmm. know. And I think that's how we've managed to increase the number of projects per person that we can deliver to over sort of 10 times what it was um, because I've seen great people stuck in projects waiting for decisions and actually you're not, you're not contributing to organizational goals. So, you know, that for us was the first thing that we absolutely wanted to, to try and overcome saying that, you know, Vitality is a a pretty fast paced organization and and, and we we don't always really need to detach. And that's why typical turnaround for us is if for a project is seven working days, you know, we, we are built for that efficacy and speed because that's what we need to be in our organizational context, but also appreciate, you know, kind of needs vary. But, you know, let's let's take it to someone darkens our door and, you know, says, um, 
I've got a request for training. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm probably a bit grumpier and to the point after being in the profession for a while now, albeit not as much as, as my esteemed colleagues. But I guess quite quickly, I realized that the conversations that people came to me and asked about training were just, they were very cyclical and pretty similar. Mm-hmm. It always made me uh, think of... Um, cardboard and he just lifts off a piece of cardboard another question underneath (laughs) i I just felt i could just be replaced by a really well-made sign at at some point (laughs) so i think what what i just thought was you know it's a little rule that used to apply to my it was that if you're doing something manually every time um you're probably doing it wrong i think the first thing for us was how can we how can we create a system in which those initial conversations can can move away from training to talk about business performance issues? Mm-hmm. You know, and actually, you don't always need to be overly direct in those conversations or overly challenging because obviously this is someone who they want help. They value the input of L&D, which are all great things. If you can ask the question to make the penny drop all on its own, even better. So we're sort of, sort of mapping out what some of those questions are. And obviously not, it's, it's not exhaustive, but it's some things like, how do we know that this is an issue? What percentage of people in our organization do this right every time? What do they get wrong? Uh, what, if they get it wrong, what happens? You know, all of these questions start to uncover, you know, the MI, how widespread the issue is, what the performance ecosystem is. You know, how performance is corrected in the workload, if at all, which quite often it's not. You know, all of those questions we have automated into a form, um, which we use uh, through a form e-system. Um, and it just means that based on what you answer, it will just give you a, an intuitive question next. You know, and we make it um, really clear, you know, you don't have to sit there and suffer filling a form on your own. We will absolutely join you. But, you know, you know, by hook or by crook, we need that information. It's absolutely going to help us target what we need to do to help that performance. Mm. And what it does once that's being completed is it, it it sends out an automatic workflow that notifies all of the key operational leaders and circulates the outputs. And that may sound like a really rudimentary, simple step, but actually, it does that does a few really key things for us. So it transparently exposes the kind of the, the people, the, the performance problems in an organization, you know, which again creates great conversation. Um, it gives them sight of the request for support for our team, you know, the, the frequency, the, the ever escalating frequency and, and, and any overlap, you know, and it's those conversations where they're saying this in this area, they're saying this area, and it's the same problem. So let's have a conversation about it. And I think finally it sets up a, a prioritization process. And that's the next key step for us. And it's, we get all of those operational leaders together. We revisit all of those requests and we say, you know, you've got 20 organizational issues at the moment. Here is the inherent impact and cost of those issues as stated by your people. Rank them in order of priority for your business. You know, and that dynamic is one that is has definitely taken time to create, mm-hmm. but it, it kind of crucially changes the role of L&D. You know, I've seen that resources are often diverted to those that, kind of shout the loudest you know and I, i've always found that notion like absolutely bonkers you know you can you can shout at lnd if you really want to um but we don't arbitrate what happens next in an organization mm. the the results do you know and, and, and the leaders do so i think for us it's absolutely back to that business case prevails so the stakeholders must collaborative collaboratively decide on what's most important like what what's the challenge that we're trying to solve and we will say, right, well, if they're the five most important things, we're going to go and work on those. Mm-hmm. We will loop back around with the results, see which of those issues raised have remained in the next meeting, which, again, is absolutely fascinating because something that was, you know, might have been burning the building down two weeks ago suddenly might disappear off of that. And actually, you know, some of that intel is absolutely incredible uh, and, and good good, good um, insight. Um but, it, but again, it, it, it's, it helps you stay close to the people that you're supporting. You know, seeing the 20 organizational challenges that are happening in any business area, you can't buy that intel and you don't have to even go and get it. They're going to bring it to you. It's absolutely you know, fascinating stuff. 
So, you know, once, once we've done that and once that's over, um, it's time for our team to get on with, with impacting performance. So, you know, we'll take all the data. We might gather more. Obviously, we'll analyse that issue then at that point. And in parallel with that, we'll call a, a meeting with the, the impacted operational stakeholders and we'll kind of, you know, talk to them about that issue in that, that singular meeting. Because again, you know, you'll have seen it yourselves. Uh, a head of department may say that there's an issue. Sometimes the people in the department might not agree with that. And again, it's quite an interesting kind of cleansing process to say, let's have an authentic conversation about this, this, this business issue, the KPIs or something like this. But in that collaborative meeting, we will, we will break down the process into individual steps, literally down to steps. Um, and those steps are the people that, 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 in, that, that people need to follow in order to achieve performance. And I think for us, that's, you know, it's, it's, there's two things here, really here. That that's our definition of performance. It's the ability to complete a given task correctly every time. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, that's important. But we also noticed that we absolutely don't discuss what people need to know. You know, people will just say, employees need to know everything. Because if they know everything, then obviously it's impossible anyway, but they can do anything. And isn't that amazing? You know? <laughs> It's just something that, again, we've really had to pivot those conversations away from no to do. Mm. Um, and it, it's, it's, I've seen it, you know, in many organisations. Sometimes the perception of employee knowledge is is a convenient way of overcoming core processes and systems. Um, you know, and this is a quote, not from not from Vitality, but in organisations I've worked in. I remember being on a, on a call and it was a system that they were looking to put in. It was awful. And the actual quote from the project manager was, yeah, that system isn't very usable, but that's a training issue. And I just thought, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, it's not. Our role is not to train people to the point they can overcome a, a, a poor system. Mm. You know, we will focus on the performing the task right every time and what gets us to that outcome every time with, with the greatest efficiency wins Mm -hmm. so i think that that for us is a a key step in that in that analysis meeting to say what do people need to do and how do we get them to do that correctly every single time and with everybody in that department you know it's a really really fascinating dynamic to to break apart you learn a lot about departments when you do that and again you know when you when you break these 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 tasks down and then into steps is obviously quite a methodical process. But, but again, spelling out the workflow, you, you can be really critical about those processes. You know, and you, you're sitting with operational leaders and it, it's fascinating. And you'll say, right, OK, this is what people need to do to get this right. And so often the leaders will go, that's absolutely crazy. No wonder people are not getting this right. Yeah. Like how that's not how we want it to work mm. and that is again it's a that's such it's such a productive departure point for those conversations you know because you've talked to us about a course we're sitting here saying this is not a very good process and you, that's coming from you so let's shift those conversations and start to identify the barriers to performance in that process and if it's something, you know, that your people need to do regularly and there's 75 steps to take to get it right, we, you might train people to follow those steps, but it has all of the hallmarks of something that is going to be a fertile ground for human error. Mm-hmm. And, and in that context, training is not going to overcome it. So how do we? Okay, that's when we can start getting into remove steps, automate steps, anything but training, because that won't do it in that juncture. Um, so again, you know, training might be necessary, but in these scenarios, it's not sufficient on its own. And I think those those conversations are absolutely brilliant for leaders to understand what the workflow is because they're busy people, and sometimes you know, it could be years since they've actually seen it laid out to that to that level of detail. I think that that focus then about making it simpler figure out how you want it to work that's all happening in the same meeting you know we, we we need to agree on one best way to do this if we can you know for our staff 
at our customers. And I think that's something that's quite often overlooked. A new process shouldn't just be great for customers. It needs to be great for our people too. And as, as the old addict goes that we've probably heard a million times, a, a bad process beats a good, a good person every time. So again, we, let's assume we're in that room, we've broken it apart and we've mapped it out and we understand what we want people to do to achieve performance. We, we then look at uh, what we call the critical tasks. And um, th those are the ones that we say, they just can't be reversed. Uh, if, you, if you get this wrong, you know, it's a real moment of truth. It's so damaging to the outcome that it cannot be recovered. Mm. And again, we, it's absolutely critical that we've got to agree those as a group. Because the reality is that it's those critical tasks that become the absolute focus for any uh, performance resources or workflow support. You know, it's those, those key moments. So it just makes so much sense to me to make sure that they are the cornerstone for any L&D team's input or project team's input. You know, we want to de-risk those key moments. And if actually we're relying on human knowledge, we know that's imperfect. Therefore, that should not be the only thing we're relying on here. Because people will forget, you know, that's been proven throughout history. Therefore, let's not be blind to that, to that reality. I think it's just an important point I want to, you know, make to, 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 to the people here is a performance resource can be anything. It's anything that helps people get something right every time. Just, you know, just to make what I think, you know, is an important point, you know, whenever I talk this over with people, they usually make an assumption that a resource is something like a handout or, or slides, you know, and absolutely um, no, no, that we're talking about real solutions in your workflow. You know, and to, to give an example, again, that, we, that I've, I've experienced many times in a career, I've no doubt many of the, the attendees that have as well, you know, people come up to you saying, um, Seb, uh, we have this box on our system that people keep forgetting to click and it's causing us problems. They need some training. And, you know, it's like, well, let, let's just start with, no, we're not going to do that. I'm not going to invite people to box clicking training. Although some of my training has been as boring as that before, but no, that's, <laughs> that's a conversation for another day. Um, it's more, the conversation then has to shift for, um, no, okay, let's, let's start thinking about almost making that a part of the system that you can't progress past unless you click it. Make the box big and red and put it in the middle of the screen. Now, they must have known to have done this at one point. Then they've started to forget to do it. So we're not going to train them again so they forget all over again. Let's flip the conversation. Now, that for me is a far more productively uh, productive conversation than let's train them again. Then you'll come back to me in six months when we forgot to click that box and we'll do the same again. Now, uh, yes, you're going to keep me in business and you're going to keep me in demand. It's not going to solve that issue for you. Now, obviously, that's a pretty provocative example. And, you know, there'll be slightly more nuanced conversation, but obviously I can be, be frank with the people in the group. But at the same time, you know, for, for me, this is, this is a much more productive uh, point to say, let's fix this problem once and for all, mm -hmm. rather than perpetuating and, and refreshing people's knowledge. Because, uh, again... That's a hallmark and an early warning sign. Hmm. I think from that point, you know, it's it's the simple things like that that we want to explore that help them get it right every time, which is a far better investment of time from the working group, you know, than you know, clicking on the right box training, which is probably just going to annoy, you know, learners anyway. Um, obviously, I'm ranting now, so apologies for that. <laughs> but um, I, th I think it's okay to be a little bit impatient with these things. Hmm. You know, I think... Um, it promotes authentic conversation. You know, we're, we're all here to make a difference. So let's do that. The departure point in general and, and, and these, you know, these task analysis meetings isn't the question, uh, what are we training here? The conversation is, imagine we couldn't train people. What could we give them instead to make sure that they got it right every single time? And it's only the things that we can't support with those tools that we actually then consider training. And even then, it's probable that isn't going to create consistent or enduring performance. So training is not the go-to. It's potentially, you know, the last resort if we can't create really intuitive, human-centric design for our, our process. So again, you know, I, I, I can't understate that enough. Really important um, session for us. Um, 
you know, when we first started them, it was a struggle. You know, people sit in a room going, what, what on earth are we doing here? You know, you're, you're, you're breaking this stuff down to a detail that nobody has. Well, that's the point. If nobody has that detail, you're going to get interpretation and variances on performance. And we don't want variances on performance. So let's find out what the detail is and make sure everyone's doing that. That's, that's the nature in it. Again, just allows you to really educate stakeholders on what you're trying to do and why that, that, that time is such a worthwhile investment. Mm. Again, in tandem with that meeting, um, and, and we do something which um, we introduced about uh, a year ago now, uh, and it's, in, in my experience, something that's so often overlooked by project teams. But we've done that task analysis meeting. We've got the process laid out. We will then take them and share them with end users early to get their input. And we just say, this is what is looking to be introduced. Basically, it's as simple as it sounds, this process. We get them to create, uh, to complete a UX assessment, a user experience assessment, which is a structured um, UX assessment we've created in conjunction with the Vitality uh, teams here, but which is based on just simple Nielsen criteria. And all it does is it's an assessment that quantifies the perceived complexity of the process. The more complex it is, the higher the propensity for human error, the more complex, the higher the volume of training input required. Well, we don't want human error. We don't want to overtrain people if we don't need to because it won't achieve the result. We want agility, we want performance, and we want to limit the, the, the human error. So complex processes deliver the opposite of what we're trying to achieve. Um, and what more powerful piece of feedback could you give to a project team than the people who would be doing this every single day don't think it's great or think it could be far simpler. Mm -hmm. It's such a a powerful platform for that. Because I guess, you know, I've experienced it before. I've sat there as L&D professional looking at a process and just thought to myself, that's rubbish. No one's ever going to do that. But that's a very difficult situation. Well, that's not, don't bother doing that. Go and speak to the end users. Your people are telling you this is not a very good process. Therefore, we would recommend you change it. And again, in that same UX meeting, we were asking them to say, how would you change it? What are the things that you would do? And we will scrape up all of that feedback. It goes straight back to those project teams Mm. to say, you know, we've got some challenges here. Again, people can say to us, and we've, we've baked in some questions here to say, how would you want to be supported in following this? What tools do you want in your workflow? If you got stuck, where would you look? because then we know where to put some of this stuff. So again, we're using it not only to shape the process, but also to shape whatever resources or learning experience might exist or have to exist at that point. I think from us, we're we're almost trying to consistently labor that point with with our teams to say, you know, it's in that intuition that we we will live and die on some of these processes. You know, we always use the example every time your iPhone needs to get updated, um, there's not a chat from Apple standing in the front garden with a flip chart. It's just done in such an intuitive way that you know how to do it. And the processes that we should pilot should be no different. And again, obviously some of that captured feedback is absolutely brilliant because we will include that in our evaluation and we'll say, before you started doing this, you thought it was this complex. You've now been doing it for two months. In retrospect, was it as, as complex as you thought it was? And you can start to rationalize, you know, perceived complexity versus actual complexity. Mm-hmm. You know, do we need to do anything else with that with that process now it's being delivered? So it does a lot of good things for us, you know, that that process. Uh, so you got a question? <laughs> Yeah, I think yeah, Sebastian, exactly. it's going to be really helpful to uh, to bring this to life very shortly with um, with examples. But I, I can see we've got uh, we've got a question coming, uh, Guy. Uh, did you want to um, uh, to share that one, or do you have any more yourself? Uh, well, let me let me take this question here. Uh, the the person says that uh, you talking about the training issue that landed in the process issue really resonated with her. So do you do you take on work to redesign the process with IT or other support functions? Or do you just tell stakeholders what they need to start uh, doing uh, that it's out of your uh, your field? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So it's such a strange thing sometimes because irrespective of whether you, you've pivoted performance, I've found in organizations that people will ask you as L&D to design processes. 
Uh, I, n- I never know where that misconception has come from, but it is a pretty wide, wide held belief. We would never design processes, but I think it, there's one thing turning around saying this process isn't very good, which is not outrageously helpful to organization, to then saying, I tell you what, my gut tells us this is difficult to follow. You think that, let's go and ask our end users. Let's get feedback from that as to how they would improve that process and how it should be created. All of that feedback then goes back to the project teams. So I think it, that's the interesting thing that we're facilitating two services for an organization that some, you know, typically some L&D teams don't have. If you want to know how a process should work, we can facilitate a meeting for that. We can identify some gaps in there. That goes back to the team to say, you need to fill those gaps because nobody knows how that, how that works. If you want to identify how a process might not be working, we can help. You can come to that meeting, we can facilitate it. If you want to change it, absolutely you can change it, but we're not going to necessarily do that for you. In fact, we won't do that for you. If you want to understand how end users rate this process and how their experience is, again, we can, we can complete that service for you all in the name of better performance. And that for us is almost diversifying our, our remit and our impact on organization, which is just outside of the core, the core responsibilities of what, what a typical team might do. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, it would be really helpful to, uh, to bring this to life, uh, Sebastian, um, on, um, on a real life example. Um, an initiative that you've run that you've uh, you've run this way, and um, I, I wonder if you could incorporate in uh, into that uh, any objections that you found as well, like because um, because the question as I as I mentioned earlier, um, one of the objections I get greatly from uh, from practitioners is um, how do I get permission to do this? How do I how do I what's the change management required? What what do I need to do? to get stakeholders to buy this new approach. I wonder whether you could bring this to life with, this is what you did. This is the analysis that you did, or, or you know, this, this is the, the thing that came to you. This was the analysis that was done. This was our approach to, to the solution. And this is how we brought stakeholders or, or, or folks with us. Yeah, absolutely. I think to, if with your permission, just to make it real, I'll just talk a little bit about the deployment after those that, that task analysis meeting, if that's okay, just to, to help people mm. understand what we do after that point. So, you know, we, we, we know the resources created, we know the, the, the process. Um, again, as, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll deploy kind of agile, small batch learning projects, uh, products to help people get to, to those resources and use them. We know no one gets things right every time. So again, we'll make sure we deploy, you know, interventions after the fact. Again, we'll test the experience with people and get that feedback. So we're not just testing the process, we're also testing, you know, the learning experience, which again, is absolutely invaluable. You know, quite often LD teams will say, we've got 300 people to be trained here, let's train through them, absolutely, and just do the same experience as 300 people, and we might make a change when we train them all. Absolutely not, we, we're constantly updating that experience of people as we go through that, because if you can provide a, a better experience to the last 100 people, well, don't wait, just, just do it. And again, what we're doing constantly throughout that time is evaluating um, not just the learning experience, but also the resources. So it will be, what have people clicked on? How long have they stayed on that particular resource? Are they searching for it? Are they searching for the wrong thing? How can we make it more serviceable for people? And again, constantly we're in the background getting more depth at trying to place them in the right place for individuals and, and using those, those systems. I think, um, you know, we could go on for an extended period of time about that, but I think that just helps people understand how it goes from that task analysis meeting to making it absolutely real for people um, to to the end. And again, we will evaluate that. It goes back to the prioritization meetings and we're kind of saying, well, here's where we got to in terms of the pre agreed metrics. It's not necessarily onto those 20 things. It's did we get where we wanted to get to and does this go and move back up to the top of the priority lists Mm. i think in terms of um the permission piece if we if we probably should revisit that first um i've always really struggled to answer this one in in a way that's not really direct but i think the reality is why would you ask permission and that i'm not saying that to be overly provocative but if you are attributable for learning development you know it's your your neck on the block for the results that you achieve 
then, then you should have the ability to decide how you achieve those results. And you just have to be accountable for those results. It doesn't need to be a fancy kickoff meeting. You don't need to rebrand your department. You don't need to go and visit every person, every far from corner of an organization to get any agreement. You don't need to do it. If this is the best thing for your organization, you're convinced in that, you might share some of the thought leadership. You might take people through some of the change management about here is how it's going to change. And then you share those results because the results will just give you permission to carry on perpetuating this throughout the business and giving you a little bit of free reign. So I think my first piece of advice would be don't ask for, for permission, seek forgiveness and, and, and share those results. That's not to say that I don't realize that this is a really scary thing. I was absolutely frightened when I decided to do this because if this goes really wrong, obviously it can make you, it can make you look bad. So nobody wants that. But at the same time, there's a reason why people are seeking to, to pivot. And, and, the, and I think that, that could be that the traditional methods are not keeping up. Mm. So it's how long are we going to wait before we realize that that, that that is only going to accentuate, the rate of organizational change is going to accentuate, and we're all you know, subject to the same conversations. People want root competence quicker. They want people to perform more. They want people to spend less time from their roles. We're then greeted with a model to the, that would allow you to do that and a, and a method that allows you to do that don't seek permission to employ it that's what your organization wants from you as as, as, as a professional hmm. um do you want to talk about a specific example though is that what yeah what please yeah, yeah something that came to you yeah uh yeah okay um I, I'll share an example that was deliberately before I managed to put any of these processes in place. Mm -hmm. So I think if you're looking to make a pivot performance, you know, sometimes people will share ones that were recent, but you kind of figured it out then and your stakeholders get them. So they're not, they're, they're sometimes not relatable. Mm -hmm. So I think well, the one I'll share was literally at the very start of my journey. Um, and I work in medical insurance, fatalities and medical insurance business. And quite often it's, it, it's a tough business because you don't hire medical professionals there's a massive complexity of the human body and we used to get a perpetual request coming in um, from, from the, the senior management team to say you've got to do refreshers on underwriting knowledge and the minute I hear refresher you know alarm bells start ringing for a number of reasons you know typically it means there's a there's an issue in the performance ecosystem somewhere if people are forgetting things, we're relying on human memory. You know, we know that's an issue. Um, and it also means the support networks and the feedback mechanisms aren't correct in the performance. And I, you know, the conversation I remember having was, it's a bit like um, saying that my house is cold, renting a space heater, turning it on for a few hours, sending it back, and then wondering why your house is cold again. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the house is not maintaining the temperature, the ecosystem is not maintaining itself. So you need to fix that. And again, in terms of underwriting, if that's the problem, we're expecting our frontline staff members to hold an incredible wealth of information about medical conditions and claims. You know, it was tr honestly, it was eye watering. You know, I would sit next to them and listen to them on the phone and think, I don't understand how this person's doing their job. So what we did was then we shifted that conversation. It was just very subtle to begin with away from knowledge and to how do we get this right every time? You know, what, what could we give them that would reduce the burden on the human brain? Mm -hmm. you know, and that was the bit for me that you know, let's stop talking about training people everything because that's, that's your first warning sign. So what could we give them? And again, we, we met, had a number of these conversations because it didn't go brilliantly first time. People were kind of like, what are you getting at? What are you talking about? And what we did was we created a working group and the continuous improvement team here. Um, you know, and we came to the conclusion that we're just going to create some just simple interactive decision trees to help. So when a member calls up, they're presented with a medical condition, you click it and it tells you what to ask about next and what you need to know. You know, it sounds such a simple solution, but that, that for me was the start of the shift, you know, and it used to be that the L&D team here were held to account for people not having this unsustainable volume of information in their head, mm. but no training course is, is going to do that for you. So we flip it to say, what will support them in their role and move away from the refresher cycle? And, you know, those, those decision trees were, 
were, were created and implemented about four years ago. And it's been ironically four years since I've been asked for underwriting uh, refresher training, you know. So I think that that for me is a good example because you don't need different processes. Again, you, you, you just need that different mindset. And I think that pivot is away from what people need to know to what exactly they need to do and how do we get that right every single time. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's great. And, and Guy, I see there's another question coming uh, about the uh, what, what happens to the employee side and their expectations. Yeah, we've got a couple of uh, good questions here. One of them is about, you know, it, how can you can make employees feel valued? That's something that I'm paraphrasing the question here. Uh, something that training can or might do is make employees feel valued and attended to. Um, so that's one question. And then there's another one that's, you know, how do we deal with uh, motivation? Uh, their example is wearing proper equipment in a hospital, given the fourth wave of COVID. So there's a people side of this thing. And how do we help the, the people in terms of their own motivation or their lack of motivation? And how do we make them feel valued? Mm. You know, the, the, the employee feeling valued, you know, is... It, it, is one which I challenge to say, you know, if we're relying on delivering training courses to make people feel valued, then there is there is probably an issue in the organisation there in terms of how they, they perceive that value. Um, we're not here to um, provide a training course to people so they feel great and they connect. You know, that is a byproduct, that is an unintended byproduct. We're here to help you perform in your job. And I think, ironically, in the organisations where I've seen the highest attrition, is where people don't feel like they've got either the tools or the skills to do their job. Mm. And quite quickly, that can cause people to feel like they're not making a difference and, and, and they, they, they leave. And it's always, you'll see the same questions in EMPS surveys globally. Are you given the tools and the skills to do your job? It's not just the skills, not just the tools, it's a combination of the two. And I think what we're doing here is throughout the process, we're inviting end users to feedback on the processes and shape them. Tell us how you want to be supported. Tell us how you want the learning experience to work for you. So ironically, we're not taking swathes of them away from their roles so you can sit in a room and, you know, eat cake. What we're actually doing is saying, well, help us support you in the best way possible and you can shape that experience. And it might be happening with 10 people at a time. But what we're not going to do is take 300 off the phone or take 10 at a time and let you shape your experience as an employee. And we found that that's done absolutely wonders for our, our net promoter scores as an organization because people feel like they're having a genuine difference. No amount of training is going to teach you to be less annoyed with that terrible process that you have to wrestle with every day. What's really going to make you feel valued is actually being able to change it and we can facilitate, facilitate those conversations. I think that the behavior question Again, it's an interesting one, you know, the motivation question. I would label it as behavior again. We, again, have to work quite closely with, with the supervisors of these teams because um, we found and a mistake we made. We obviously flipped to this and managers are kind of thinking, you know, where's the formal training course? What's going on with this? And actually managers then get questions. And it was a bit of a rookie mistake from us. But what we realized then was managers should get more. So actually managers will get a slightly elongated experience and access to more resources up front. So they don't feel like they're being absolutely blindsided with some of these questions that happen when they're happening in the actual workflow. And what we always do for the managers is create mechanisms in which that they can have chat functions with the rest, you know, social interaction with the rest of the managers there to say, I've got this problem. How do I figure that out? How do we make sure that we're solving this problem for our employees? And it just allows them to work together, solve those issues and create that cohort. But again, as an L&D team, we will scrape some of those common things and make sure that they're reflecting resources. So the managers, again, feel like that they're shaping and contributing to having their teams being absolutely productive, you know, being productive quicker. And it comes back to the old adage that, you know, don't believe that anybody comes into an organization or into their job every day wanted to, to do anything other than a good job. Mm. And actually what we're here to do then is to support you to be able to do that job. So I think it's it, it's involving those managers and making sure they absolutely feel supported because on face value, 
it, they'll just think like, well, normally I would send my team for an hour's training and magically they'd come back and everything will be absolutely fine. Well, you know, that's not the reality. You've got to be there to support these individuals. You've got to know where those resources are as well, because the questions will absolutely come to you. Mm. And what I'm hearing well, yeah, within yeah, that, yeah. Sebastian, is that um, that you're not replacing training with um, with 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 your analysis and then your targeted support, the analysis and targeted support a lot of the time replaces fumbling around and making the same mistakes that have already been made like thousands of times or, or, or helping people that don't feel as if they're supported. Um, in my experience, people don't attend that many courses. Um, there's, there's a study that says that, uh, that um, respondents have said they hadn't, 77% of respondents have said they hadn't attended a course of any kind in the last two years. So you actually helping people with the inefficiencies and ineffectiveness of their every day is largely welcome. It's not that they're not attending courses, which you know I'm, I'm sure that you do run, run those and, and people have got plenty of time to feel valued but as you know, I, I agree with what you said. It's been my experience as well that whether you've got people um, exploring uh, an issue of the uh, as part of the analysis program, they find that as valuable as any training program they've ever been in. You are talking about what is broken for them, and then they're exploring the most efficient ways. You've got people leaving the room thinking, "Well, that was incredible," and you're you're thinking, "Well, I got exactly what I needed," but I'm glad you feel good about it. Um, yeah. uh, and you know, so so what you're doing is with analysis, you are staying laser focused on what is critically important. You're holding yourself and your team accountable for actual results, as well as not taking anything away apart from large scale inefficiency uh, and, um, uh, and and what is today in learning development um, uh, uh, often not not really an abundance of, uh, of resources yeah and it's in that it's in that consistent communication in which you you can almost with that with, with a bit of humility say you know you guys have been searching for this resource we didn't put it in, in perhaps the right place we've listened to you we've now moved it to here Actually, we realized that you've been searching using this term and the right things aren't coming up for you. So we've changed the search term, we've bundled the two. And just with that constant communication, they can see that in the background, you're, you're, you're engineering this to be the most intuitive process possible. And again, the feedback is, is extraordinarily positive because it, they, they feel like you're closer to their workflow and you're understanding their challenges. And by constantly asking for that feedback and what would make this easier for you, they at least have that outlet. Whereas, you know, a training course, a lot of it can be conceptual. You go out and you do your job. No, we're going to spend most of our time sitting next to you when you're doing that. So we can make sure that you've got what you need to get this right every single time because we can't ensure that when you're in a formal learning experience. Mm. And Sebastian, we, we've, we've come to the end of the, uh, of the session. Uh, and, uh, and before we, uh, we, we kind of wrap this up, uh, and point people in the in the direction of the of the next session um, that we have running. I wonder if 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 people are listening to this and they're thinking that this is this is really interesting. What what one piece of advice would you give them to 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 get started? I think there's been some great people out there who who are great voices. Obviously, um, both Sarah, David and Guy are, have, have put out a lot of great content, you know, in this space and to to go and, and to listen to that stuff. Absolutely, feel feel free to reach out on LinkedIn because every time people, you know, there's discussions around this, you learn something more and you take something more from it. But I would just say it's this piece around not asking permission anymore. You know, start let's start really small and walk into your next meeting with a stakeholder and start having conversations that are around what exactly the people need to do. What's the specific process that you want to follow here? Because even that will start to shift the conversation to, okay, someone needs a training room, there's 100 people, for example, well, they should all be doing the same thing. So is everyone doing the same thing? No, okay, so when they don't do the same thing, what happens? Mm. And you can start to snowball your questioning from there to start to really understand what performance is and what do we expect performance to be in this organization. And I think if you're having those conversations, the mindset will start to shift because you'll uncover the odd nugget in a conversation. It will just keep you going for the next few years. And that's exactly what's happened here. It started small, but it will snowball quickly. Wonderful. That's great advice, as well as everything else you've shared uh, today, Sebastian. So, uh, so thank you very much for uh, uh, for that. Um, uh, uh, what I would like to uh, to 
to to draw people's attention to is um, we have uh, this is the um, the second in a series of uh, of seven uh, sessions that uh, that we've got uh, running, and uh, we run these every two weeks. Um, the next uh, one we have is with Amory Burbage, uh, who is head of learning and development at Utility Warehouse. We, again, we're going to be talking with her about her pivot. Um, thank you very much for uh, for for taking the time and uh, uh, and being with us with this conversation. Thank you for your questions. If you have asked questions uh, that we've not got to, uh, then we'll endeavour to do so. But also um, the the very last session that we're running in December is a session that we're, we're handing over to, to those who, uh, who are joining us, um, uh, helping with, uh, with, with, with your pivot uh, to performance. We'll be inviting uh, panel members um, here as well. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, we're recording this session and we will email uh, everybody who's registered and attended with a link so that you can access the video recording. Um, but all's left to say is, again, thank you very much, Sebastian, for, uh, for, for being our guest this week. And thank you uh, to you and, uh, and goodbye.